Our agenda today will be about two lectures. The first lecture by Dr. Wang Gong from China about the use of flexible ureteroscopy treating ureteral stones after urinary diversion. It's a challenge situation may be faced by any urologist. And second lecture by Dr. Yeloran Tanidir from Turkey about the advantage of disposable flexible ureteroscopy. And he will show also some pre-recorded surgery videos illustration, illustrating the advantage of disposable flexible ureteroscopy. Before introducing our guests, I would like to praise to praise present company, not only for organizing this series of webinar during this COVID pandemic, but for its contribution during the last years for promoting on the urology in our region, North Africa, and for creating links between urologists all over the world. As we noticed today, we have the opportunity to learn from experience of Dr. Gong Yang from China and Dr. Yilor Tanader from Turkey. So Pusen Company is building bridges between very regi many regions and cultures, which help enhancing the development of endurology globally. So I'm honored, I have the honor to introduce Dr. Professor Wang Gong, Professor and Consultant Urologist, Peking University, China, is a Vice Chair of Group of Urolithiasis, Beijing Medical Association, Committee Member of China's Association of Integrative Medicine, and the Member of China's Urological Association Guideline on Urologists, and Editor of China's Journal of Urology. And uh, before giving the permitting Dr. Wang Gong to share his presentation, I would like to demand the participant to feel free to post the questions in the chat box. And I will frequently look for, at the chat box and share questions to our speakers at the end of each talk. Would you mind, uh, Professor Wang Gong, to share your presentation? Thank you, Professor Sarf. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, moderating, and thank you for Person Company for uh, organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, now I'll share my. Oh, wait a minute, please. Yes. Uh, uh, in my uh, presentation, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll give a short uh, introduce of myself. I come from uh, Beijing Medical University First Hospital, uh, which is one of the uh, oldest hospitals in Beijing and who has uh, a long a history of more than 100 years. Uh, and this picture is our hospital now. Uh, uh, later, I will show uh, a, a rare case and a very uh, challenging case. Uh, this is a young guy, 20-year-old, uh, with uh, intermittent left flank pain. Uh, just we can see on the QOB film, we can see a, a, maybe a ureteral uh, stone on the left side, uh, lower part of uh, uh, ureter. What kind of advice, treatment advice, we shall give to this young guy? Uh, wait a minute, please. There is something special on this film. We can see the pubic uh, syf synthesis uh, on ural. So we should know, uh, understand uh, patient's history, uh, physical examination, and imaging first. Uh, according to the history, 
is a uh, this this guy was born with atrophy, and he get his uh, abnormality repaired at the age of two. Uh, when he was age thirteen, uh, the patient suffered from uh, left hydronephrosis, and uh, uh, he then uh, undertaken uh, blood augmentation with ileocecum and the uh, suture of the blood and neck so he could get continence with self castorization And in the meantime, uh, he, he got a left ureter implantation. Uh, two years before he came to my clinic, he found a left uh, ureter stone, a small stone. Uh, but you can see on the IVP, there's no hydronephrosis. The patient uh, decided to uh, observe and then uh, the stone grows gradually. Uh, till he came to my uh, clinic, the stone grows to uh, five centimeters. So what kind of treatment we, can, uh, we shall give to him now? Uh, shall we do it uh, with open or uh, ureteroscopy or flexible ureteroscopy or something else? Uh, but because the patient is uh, in his graduate, st graduate uh, state and he has mild uh, symptoms, he decided to, to go on to observe. Uh, two years later, now you can see the, the left side uh, hydronephrosis uh, aggregate, uh, aggregates, uh, deteriorates uh, with a stone uh, growth to five. 0.5 centimeters in length, and the city's, uh, city value is 800. And his uh, urine culture is negative, and he has a uh, normal uh, renal function. So we can first ask the question to both doctors, could you uh, give some advice? Uh, what kind of treatment we shall give to this patient? Uh, Dr. Ilaran? Thank you very much. Well, there, you know, uh, it is a long stone. And with these stones, when there are so high hydronephrosis, you can have two types of uh, treatment. One is integrate ureteroscopy, the other one is retrograde, and you can also do a laparoscopic surgery. But for the initial, I will, I will always start with the easy one, then go to the complicated one. Okay, which one is an uh, easy one? Retrograde oh. or anti-grade? Uh, Initially, would, yep. yep. And uh, uh, just a comment, I, I would like to, to know why there is a delay, because uh, why not treating him at the first while? Because uh, it was three centimeters at that time, maybe, uh, you, you, you would have you, you would be better to, to to intervene at that time first second I don't know I don't have the idea about uh, if there is a stenosis in the reimplantation of the ureter hmm? treating the the, the, uh, the stone in the ureter but not having the idea about the permeability beneath it's a problem so uh, before uh, thinking about integrate and retrograde, uh, do you have any idea about the replantation? Okay, that's a great advice. Uh, be because uh, the patient came to, to, to my clinic just two years before, uh, when the, the stone already grows to five centimeters in length. So the, the formal history, I, I cannot determine. I cannot give my advice to him. Uh, okay. So let, let's go on. Uh, maybe, maybe we can uh, give a detailed discussion uh, in the end. So we can maybe we can, we have several choices: uh, neutral grade uh, your URS or anti grade URS, or even some doctors advise open uh, uh, lethal lithotomy. So to each kind of uh, treatment, there are a lot of uh, questions, concerns on the, on it. So. Uh, normally, we, we can we could try the retrograde uh, first, but there are some questions. First, shall we do it through the appendix conduit? 
because this is a reverse direction uh, compared to our normal transurethral URS. So maybe it's difficult. Uh, the second, how can we find the re-implanted re ureter orifice uh, on the uh, uh, ileal uh, system mucosa? Maybe there's some difficulty to, to find it. Or we can open up my mind, our mind to, to, to create a new method to uh, do this operation through a, a super pubic transpouch puncture to, uh, uh, to overcome the trans uh, appendix uh, approach. Uh, so let, let's, uh, our let's go on. Our, our decision is to uh, combine uh, PCN and integrate uh, FURS. Uh, first of all, uh, we try the, the retrograde uh, first. The first we inspect the appendix and uh, into the pouch. And this is the, the pouch. You can see some uh, mucus. Yes, mucus. And uh, you can see this is the bladder uh, wall, and the upper part is uh, uh, the column wall. And we, we use a hydrophilic gut wire try to put through several uh, holes, but we cannot uh, exceed, advance it. So we fail to find the, 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 the right left orifice. So the retrograde approach is blocked. And then we try to do uh, combine uh, PCL and plus uh, anti-grid. But under, you know, we, we do most of our procedures under ultrasound guidance to, to do the PCL puncture. But under the uh, ultrasound picture, there's no hydronephrosis. What's, what's wrong with it? So I, I see there, uh, putting my mind to find a way out. Uh, now, the second question, uh, could, could you, uh, both doctors, give a shot of advice? How can we uh, gain a PC access, Dr. Sarf? You, uh, I think in this case, you can do an intravenous serotography perioperatively, I mean, on the, t on the operative table. But I think the, the disadvantage that it would take time to, to see the secretion in the kidney. Hmm? But Great. it's possible. Oh, it's, it's possible. Yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tanider? Well, I think there is a window. I mean, on the upper side, yeah, spleen is blocking the puncture side, but from the down side, from the down lower pole, you can easily access hybrids. Oh, uh, yes, uh, because after, according to the CT scan, uh, pre, uh, pre operation. We can find that the, the left side has a mild to uh, mild hydronephrosis. Why the, the, the patient shows no hydronephrosis now is first, the, the, the block uh, obstruction, le left side obstruction is not so severe. It's maybe a mild to a moderate. And the second, because the, before the operation, the patient has fasting his, uh, uh, yeah, dehydrate. So, dehydrate, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we, we, we hydrate the patient and give some uh, for uh, uh, furosemide. And if, if we can uh, down use uh, x ray guidance, we can uh, intra uh, venous uh, give some uh, contrast to gain the uh, renal gram. So, under the uh, ultrasound guidance with a 10 minutes later, we can see the hydronephrosis. Unfortunately, I, I lost the picture. And the normal, uh, according to my design, uh, I would like to, to puncture the mid upper part, uh, and uh, which is our anti-grade uh, ureteroscopy. But uh, unfortunately, the spleen covers the upper part of the kidney, so I have to choose a mid lower pole puncture. And I made it. 
and you can see the, this is the she uh, access. Uh, this is the she's, and we use a flexible ureteroscope to look downward and find the stone there, a, a large stone. And with the uh, ureter lumen dilated. And the, the third question is, after we find the stone, what are our strategies to treat the stone? To dust or to fragment? Uh, what kind of uh, advice, Dr. Vassaf? Before talking about the dust you know, fragmentation, or fragmentation, so what's the, the sheet you have used to, to introduce your Ureteroscopy. It's uh, is is the the access sheet that we use for ureteroscopy, or just a sheet of the nef of the nephroscope. Yes, it's a sheet, a piece of sheet, not a UAS sheet. Oh yeah. Well, for these patients, I use a PCNL access, and then I introduce a ureteral access sheet from the up to the down uh, upon a guide wire so you can easily uh, wash the fragments off and i always try to use a large one because the ureter is dilated if a, if you want to have more stones out you can also grab the stone and try to get it up to the kidney so that you can easily get the fragments out okay Great, but thanks. I'll, I'll, but I'll try to use the dusting initially if uh, it, these doesn't really work because, for, because the fragments really bother you uh, when you are trying to get rid of the stone in the ureter. I mean. Yes, that's the, that's the concern uh, of mine. Uh, thank you for your advice, great idea. But depends on the laser because uh, for, uh, I mean dusting, Five centimeter, it will take you a long time. Yeah, that's why I, I I try to pull the stone to the kidney. You know, it is a large stone, but it is long, and the ureter is quite dilated. I guess the stone can also get to the kidney. Yeah. Uh, so I, to my uh, strategy, I because of the the, the patient ureter is dilated well, quite well. So I try to uh, pull the stone uh, up with a basket, but it, it try, uh, did try. take some time to do it. Yeah. Because it's a long stone, you cannot grasp all, uh, all the whole stone. So you can, I can only grasp one tip of it. But when you know, uh, if we done it, uh, did it in a longer tuning uh, way, we can only try to grasp the tip, upper tip of the stone. Fortunately, uh, I did it and pull the stone gradually upward, but the stone blocked in the near, uh, near the UPG junction. We can see on the CT scan, there is a curve, there's a torsion on the part, uh, upper part of the eraser, so the stone blocked here. But fortunately, uh, even in this position, we can do it uh, with a PCL uh, technique. And uh, uh, just now, uh, as we concern that the, the stone may move downward or the, the stone fragments can hard to take out. So I use a basket to, to block the stone from it moving backward, downward. Use a, use a block device. Actually, we use a, a stone cone to, yeah. to in a way of, uh, on the upper side, when we do it in the original, <laughs> in yeah, the original so. movie, yeah. So I block the stone from it moving down and I began to, to do it with the PCL approach. It's pretty easy to, to, to hit the stone. And we, I use uh, not a dusting uh, strategy. I use a uh, fragmented, uh, fragmented, 
fragment, uh, fragment, fragment, fragment. Yes, fragmentation strategy. So I use a uh, one draw times fifteen hertz, and uh, strike the stone uh, correctly, uh, accurately. After each big fragment uh, generates, I will uh, flush it through the sheath, and in the end, you can see the basket downside on the other side. So they put the, the left stone, the, the residual stone upward and take them out. And it's, it's just the beginning. We can, what, what we concern is the, how about the, all the stone fragments can be taken out. So I use this basket, move it downward and pull it upward with irrigation. Just like this. Because the drainage is well, so I increase the information uh, irrigation uh, flow, flow uh, rate and uh, move the basket up and work uh, repeatedly. And at the end, let me check the ureter again with a flexible ureteroscope. And all the stone fragments are flushed out. And we can move to the tip of the left ureter, but we cannot move it, uh, advance our scope into the bladder. Uh, oops, sorry. And the result is uh, because the stone is uh, fragmented and uh, flushed out all the stones, we can see it uh, maybe uh, five in length. Would you, share again your, would you share again your, uh, your presentation? Because uh, we don't see the, the video. If, if oh, can. I see. Can you see it? Yeah. Now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, full screen, please. Full screen. Can you make it full screen? Can make it in full screen. Dr. Wong? Uh, Dr. Wong? Oh. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, you can. Oh, uh, the zoom it shows uh, starting, the restarting. Mm. And uh, let's go on. And this is the result. We can see the stones is, is pretty big. The, the, even the fragments taken out, uh, it tested five in some meters in length. And the post-operative QB first day shows no uh, residual stone. And the patient is uh, full up uh, clearly. Uh, three months later, we can see there's no hydrolephrasis uh, of the left kidney and no residual stones of the left ureter. And the renal gram uh, shows both sides has normal function and normal uh, irrigation. And uh, post-operative 1.5 year, the patient uh, find his uh, CT scan. There's we also, we, yeah? We, we don't see the presentation, okay? Oh, I see. There's would some you, problem. Would you please oh. share the slides? Or uh, the presentation is, uh, is over? Okay. 
No, he yeah. has a couple of slides left, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, can I see it? Yep. If we can. you come back to the... Can you make it full screen, please? Yeah. Yeah, this can side. Come back to the okay. slide number 16. Yeah. 16? This yes, one? Number okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The Yes. Maybe good, there's good. some problem about the Zoom. That now it is uh, restarting the, 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 the Zoom. Yeah. And, and no, it's okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is the result. You can show there's no register stone on the post of one day QB. And uh, three, months, three months later, uh, the patient uh, follow up shows no uh, hydronephrosis and no ureter stone. And the renogram shows normal left side renal function and normal irrigation. And 1.5 years later, uh, shows also the same result, no hydronephrosis and no ureter stone or dilation. So a short discussion, because nowadays there is more and more patient get uh, a urinary diversion, uh, uh, including incontinent or continent. There are lots of different operations. And after this operation, uh, incidence of uh, cannulae after diversion uh, may be increased a little bit. But uh, different doctors show different results. The incidence rate of uh, cannulae uh, differs from 3% uh, to 43%. And you can see in two different uh, studies, one shows by Gilbert in 1920s, uh, 13 of 150, uh, 1,500 patients, which is incontinent uh, diversion. The stone rates uh, 1.1 and also PDIC 5.4%. But another doctor shows the incontinent uh, diversion stone uh, rates is 11%, uh, which in these two different uh, studies shows different results. That means uh, urinary diversion differs a lot uh, between different operations and different doctors. So the result uh, has a great tense trends of uh, heterogeneity. And these, these are patients we treated uh, with renal stones after urinary diversion. And these are uh, ureter stones uh, with, uh, after urinary diversion. And how to treat this patient? Because this kind of patient uh, has a, a, lot, a little bit challenging because uh, the anatomy of this patient changes a lot. Uh, to normal people. Uh, in different situations, we can have different strategy. For small stones with no obstruction, we can give observation or as the WL, just as Dr. Sarah first uh, commented, if the patient uh, came in the first period, maybe we can give him uh, SWL first. And if you uh, have to do uh, with the uh, Anterior urology, uh, we should try the retrograde first, though, uh, but it has a very low success rate according to different studies. So the, the most of the patients treat, treatment strategy is PCNA combined anti-grade FURS. But there are some uh, tricks. First, PCNA excess, because you cannot insert a ureteral catheter to assist our PCNA puncture. So hydration and diuretics may help. And the second is draw the ureter stone back to the kidney to make this uh, uh, anti-grade FURS to a simple PCNL. And uh, our strategy to take out the stone is fragmenting uh, and basketing with PCNL, or just as Dr. Uh, Ilarin Hamilton says just now, if we fragment the stone in the ureter in place, we could use a uh, US cheese and with a, uh, a testing strategy. And thank you for your attention. And these are 
uh, scenic places in Beijing. I welcome to Beijing someday. Yes, we have okay. nice landscapes mm. in Beijing. Thank you very much for this presentation. It's very interesting and challenging cases because uh, nowadays uh, we don't see, uh, we see few cases of uh, urinary leches after diversion because I think the technique of diversion is, is getting evolved. Now we use really uh, not absorbable sutures or uh, uh, there is a prevention of uh, some kind, but in, 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 in a way, this uh, situation still exists in, and the urologist uh, must have tools to, to face this uh, situation. And now with the under urology, I think uh, as you, 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 you show today uh, with the uh, flexible ureteroscopy and uh, drug uh, uh, PCNL, it's uh, a very interesting approach. There's a question for Dr. Wong actually. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, and an audience, Dr. Rahman, Rahman uh, yes. is asking you something about uh, the, the uh, retrieving of the stone. Why couldn't you get from the access sheet? Because you have a small one, right? It was a mini access. Yes. Yeah, that's, yes. that's, that's the reason. Yeah. And you choose the mini axis because really it's, the, the plane was closed and uh, it's better to, to, to use a mini axis than, uh, I mean, a, a big, uh, a big sheet. Yes. Yeah. Another, another suggestion for the uh, puncture might be you could also see the pelvis, renal pelvis, if the um, prosomid and hydration couldn't help. You could also do a puncture with a needle to the pelvis just to fill the pelvis so that you can see the calyces with the ultrasound and you can do the right puncture to the right calyx. And you can also use the needle to downside the kidney to make another puncture from the middle one. Okay. And those those would be my strategy if the hydration and frucemic didn't actually work. And uh, even uh, I don't know if I can suggest this a kind of a blind puncture, and then um, ah, it's uh, it's possible just to, to uh, knowing the. Anatomy, you can do a blind puncture and then inject in the, uh, the right location of the puncture after. It, it's possible if uh, you cannot uh, have a ultrasound. I mean, uh, in countries when you don't have enough uh, uh, means, uh, you, you, we can do a blind puncture. What do you think? Yeah, maybe well, that's the, the uh, last choice of yeah, awesome. because but, we, can, you know, we can see the patient has hydronephrosis before operation, so we can <laughs> wait to, to gain it again. Have hydro, yes, yeah. we have hydro, hydronephrosis, a big one. Yeah. And uh, for, for the retro, retrograde approach, I think uh, uh, many authors say that it's, uh, it's, it's not possible because uh, it's not possible to, to see the, the ureter from, the, from below. Uh, but you, you know, you can also do a puncture and uh, give some ink, like metal and blue or anything, so that you can visualize the, uh, the let's say, the inner side of the uh, bladder and you can see the uh, ureter orifice there. But again, it is doing a puncture. Uh, So this patient or was in spine, can... right? Yeah. Is it a spine uh, position or was he in the oh, spine uh, position or oblique prop? superposition? Oblique spine. Okay. It is a, so oblique you, you, spine <laughs> position. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a oblique position. So there's you no need have... to to, to uh, because the the patient the blind neck has a suture, so there's no need to to pose uh, the patient. Uh, 
in a lithotomy position, just a super uh, oblique position. And did, did you put any J stent or did you put a nephrostomy? What was, uh, the, with, uh, what was the plan to, of, after the ureteroscopy? Did you put a J stent or uh, a nephrostomy tube? What was your exit uh, strategy after the surgery? I, I couldn't catch that. So he has a nephrostomy. Yes, there's a nephrostomy tube, yeah. No, you no, you're stent. Okay. Mm. Actually, I did a uh, anti-grade renogram uh, with this uh, nervous tube. Uh, you can see the whole uh, left side ureter uh, uh, shows, but it, uh, the 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 contrast going to the bladder is very uh, slow. Yeah. Okay. Well done. Okay. Congratulations. Yeah. I see, I see, yeah. I see the chat, chat box if there is an oh, there is a question at the chat box. It's a very interesting uh, case. Okay. Uh, do you have any comment, uh, Dr. Yar, or, or do you suggest to, to move to the next uh, lecture? Up on you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wang Young. It's very interesting and challenging and uh, showing the use of flexible ureteroscopy. And now, uh, if you would mind, okay, I go to base. I'd like to share my uh, other slides, just to, uh, I don't know how to do this. Anyway, so uh, right now uh, we will move to the next lecture given by uh, Dr. Yolaran Tanager from Turkey. Uh, talking about the advantage of disposable, flexible ureteroscopy. And, uh, okay, I don't know. And it will show us also a pre-carded video surgery. Would you, Dr. Yoran, sh share your, your presentation and introduce yourself because I, don't, I, I, I lost the slide. Uh, no, no problem. I will. I will. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. We're good. Okay. One moment. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an academic urologist working in Turkey in Marmara University in Istanbul, which is one of the well-known institutions in Turkey. I'm a board member uh, of European Urology Patient Information Working Group. I'm also uh, a board member of my country uh, and society, which is involved in minimal invasive urology in Turkey. I'm also a board member of Europedia which is a video library of my um, national society, one of my national society. And I'm, uh, my, my working field is in the urology and stone disease, and I also do reconstructive surgery with laparoscopic interventions. So today uh, I will be talking about the advantages of uh, disposable flexible ureteroscopes, which are actually the disadvantages of the reusable ones. Uh, 
The first flexible electroscope was first introduced in theory of medicine in 1964. However, this device lacked several things like uh, the deflection mechanism, the working channel, and they were, uh, they were only capable of doing the diagnostic stuff. With the technological improvements like holmium laser, uh, the new era of flexible electroscopy has begun. And uh, as you can see in this uh, article, which, uh, which was published actually in 1970, uh, uh, in 1987 by, by Dr. Bagley, there are certain disadvantages for the flexible reusable scopes, which are uh, still the same today. They are not available in every time you need sterilization and they have huge costs. Uh, the cost is uh, the main problem. And here in the study, fiber optic electroscopes from, from Wall, Olympus, Acne, and Stryker has been evaluated. And uh, the average case used before repair was identified as between 5 to 18. 18. And a randomized prospective trial, again, by the same uh, author, Dr. Monga, has also uh, been studied with seven uh, commercial available flexible scopes. And uh, they also provide a similar number uh, between three and 40. So uh, the, the main issue is about the fragility of these scopes. And the, they, uh, actually, uh, they actually have a shorter lifespan, like the uh, 35, the, the lifespan goes 35 uh, percentage down uh, when you use when you repair these devices for a first time. Apart from being vulnerable, the reusable scopes need several dedicated cleaning, uh, which is also a main issue. There are not much studies about, uh, the, uh, about this. However, uh, the infection has been reported in uh, some of the studies and they, they are, uh, I guess, going to increase in number in a couple of years. This initial article is from 2013, and it notes an outbreak of ertapenem-resistant enterobacter infection in two months period in 15 patients after the initial patient. The contaminated ureteroscope could only be sterilized with adding a different protocol uh, like ethylene oxide sterilization. So generally speaking, the sterility of the device is another major concern for the reusable scopes. And they are commonly, uh, they can only be dis disinfected. Uh, we cannot sterilize them. Profuse cleaning of the instrument and working channel are paramount and spatial training stuff is recommended. Also, proper handling of the scope is necessary during the process, as not um, as as in not common as it is not uncommon for the uh, reusable scopes uh, to be damaged during the cleaning. Cleaning needs chemicals, which can also be harmful for the scope and uh, and the stuff. And no matter what you can do. Uh, no matter what you can do, uh, you, you can always face with the resistant microbes like the Pseudomonas subspecies. Uh, here is another study pointing out the same problem. Authors of this study had, are working in the United States in two large multispatial centers. The researchers collected samples from every patient ready scope uh, before the operation with for the biochemical tests and microbiological culture. 
template was done in the operating room and afterwards uh, they were recleaned, sterilized for the visual examination. All these codes which were sterilized during, uh, during the, before the usage uh, of all of them, 35% actually has, still has microbes all over the face, all over uh, the working channel. And more than half of them had uh, hemoglobin and almost 70% uh, had, uh, almost 70% had uh, hemoglobin and almost half of them had uh, protein remnants within the school. So uh, the infection is an issue for the reusable scopes, but it is not an issue for the disposable ones because you only use them for once and then you dispose them and they, uh, they, they are available as sterile. Another pr important problem is the cost. Cost analysis of reusable scopes and disposable scopes show difference in some, uh, in some parts. For example, uh, reusable scopes uh, has certain items like repair, uh, cleaning, disinfectioning, sterilization, time factors, what I mean time, you can only operate one patient at a certain time uh, because you need a certain time to, for the scope to be re-sterilized again. And there are healthcare related factors. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, the uh, disposable scopes have waste handling and uh, service for workstation. These are the only two costs that you have to pay uh, for the reusable ones. For both, you need purchasing costs, you need storage costs, and you have you certainly have manpower costs. I think uh, all of us will agree that the biggest obstacle for the widespread of global adaptation for the flexible gyroscopy is not the process, the procedure. It is actually not a challenging or difficult one, but the cost is the main uh, obstacle, not the procedure. A single variable, uh, such as the number of the cases before repair, and the time until the repair, uh, uh, until the repair does not necessarily correlate with the durability of the scope. Unlike other capital equipments such as towers, laser machines, they they have uh, reusable scopes have a shorter lifespan. Even in the best hands, they can malfunction in a couple of years. And interestingly, a less experienced surgeon can use them for several times. Since their durability is, uh, is, can change, a hospital administrator cannot know the real cost in terms of repair and exchange, so they don't really want to have one in their hospital. Uh, this is a microcost analysis, again, from the United States, uh, from the clinic of Dr. Thomas Chi. In this microanalysis, a uh, smaller cost per case in, was uh, found for the disposable flexible gyroscope, which was $3.5. And you only need four minutes to use uh, an, uh, a, another scope. So the labor time is really short. However, reusables need uh, labor supply and consumables, which actually is almost $95. And you'll need at least uh, 57 minutes time to use a reusable one for the next, next patient. So the authors conclude that uh, cost of both reusable and disp disposable scopes actually seem to be comparable uh, as the cost of execution is higher for case for, case for the reusable ones. Um, 
the 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 other uh, parameters are less uh, for the uh, responsible ones. Using a heavy scope may change might change the muscle contractions, uh, and you can get fatigue uh, at at uh, at the time of retrograde intracranial surgery. This interesting study investigates the muscle involvement in ureteroscopy with the disposable and reusable scopes and fiber optic reusable ones. An EMG uh, was used to quantify the action level of the muscle groups involved in ureteroscopy. And uh, three ureteroscopes was investigated, LitiView, FlexXC, and FlexX2. At, a, uh, at each time, a sequence of navigation and procedural tasks uh, in a training model was done. And during navigation and procedural tasks, both reusable and disposable digital scopes had the lower cumulative muscle muscular load and average muscular load. However, this was not right for the um, this was not right for the uh, fiber optic one. And please remember that these, uh, these, these muscle fatigue are due to the uh, weight of the scope. In other words, the body mass index of the scope uh, has an important value at the time of ureteroscopy, which, which can lead to fatigue, muscle fatigue. And all disposable scopes are very light, and Pusson scope is the lightest one, so they will have a less fatigue at the time of retrograde intracranial surgery. Uh, concerning the evolution of the uh, single use flexible scopes, the first generation single use scopes lack several features, but like the uh, first generation reusable scopes. However, within time, we have new scopes like uh, U scope, the scope of Pusin, Little View, the scope of Boston Scientific, and Neoflex. All these digital, all these digital uh, scopes uh, have, uh, I mean, all these scopes have digital visual perspective, they have full bilateral deflection and they have good irrigation. So they are very well working instruments. There, there are several studies comparing various scopes. However, the data about the single use ones are very limited. This study investigates those, uh, those two well-known uh, disposable or single use scopes, little v1 person scope, and they compare it with the Olympus uh, URFB2 digital um, reusable scope. Authors suggest similar stone clearance and scope failure for all three scopes. However, the maneuverability was better for the person and Olympus scope and better version was seen for the reusable ones. Uh, one benefit uh, was actually noted for the person as uh, it, it didn't have a lack of screen lag uh, as the one in the little view. Here uh, you can see another study comparing the deflection of various scopes for var with various instruments. Actually, the best cumulative deflection was noted with Neoflex, and the worst cumulative deflection was noted with Ucare scope. The least effect on the deflection in the disposable flexible ureteroscopes was noted with 200 micron laser fiber for all disposable scopes. And the least effect on deflection in reusable scopes was formed with 1.5 French basket. Apart from this, uh, a 365 micron laser uh, 
had a good deflection almost for every um, apart i'm sorry apart from this uh, every disposable um, instrument every disposable instrument like basket and forceps and small laser fibers had a good deflection with the bosom fiber only 265 micron laser didn't work well also ptf uh, guide wires was uh, was uh, was really uh, not good for almost every scope uh, and they didn't have a good uh, deflection with them so the the the, the lecture about the disposable and uh, reusable ones and their advantages are over when, when we want to summarize them uh, cost actually seems to be the same for both scopes but if you are not in a center which is operating in a high patient volume the bet is to obtain a, a disposable one second the, the the reusable ones can be used in any any time so if you have any malfunction or you, if you have i'm sorry the, the disposable ones can be used in any time. So if you have any problem at the time of uh, retrograde intravenous surgery and you want to change the scopes for uh, in a short time, then you have to use a disposable one. And disposable ones do not have any infection problems. And since we are in a time where everybody is uh, swing each other. Uh, we have to be careful about the um, about the low issues. So, in in that sense, again, uh, disposable scopes seem to be better. And you can always force those scopes, and you can do whatever you want to do with them because uh, the the damage is not an issue for them. For the last uh, couple of slides, I would like to uh, provide you some uh, experience with the Pusen scope. We have been using Pusen scope for the last two years in certain operations, and it's it's more than uh, we have we had more than a hundred operation with the Pusen fiber Pusen scope. Uh, this is our first patient. He is a male patient, 35 years old, with a slim body, uh, and he has this area. He had he had several operations for stones, uh, and he had been referred to, to our institution as he has residual stones after a PCNL operation. You can see the CT scan. Uh, he has several stones in both kidney and ureter on the right side uh, kidney he had a, a 13 millimeter stone with a 700 hospital unit in the middle calyx and the right ureter he has two stones uh, which has a diameter which have they, they have a diameter of 6.5 millimeter and they're located in the proximal ureter and on the left side left kidney uh, there is a stone uh, in the inferior calyx. It is six millimeter and uh, it has a house width unit of 600. And he has another stone in the left ureter uh, with a size of five millimeter. We, we did bilateral uh, flexible ureteroscopy for the stones and uh, it was really hard because uh, there were some uh, there were some obstructed calluses, and we had to do infidulum. I'm sorry, infidulectomy uh, to the right side. And as you can see, there are several steps uh, at the time of retrograde intravenous surgery. We have to pick the stone from one side to and. Uh, transfer to this transfer stone transfer the stone to another 
location in the kidney where you can uh, you can disintegrate the stone into pieces and you again have to take some parts out for the um, stone analysis. They all went smoothly and the, the image quality seemed to be very well. And this is a 61 years old male. Again, he's not, uh, he's not quite slim, but he's also not obese. He had a stone in the uh, upper urethral, uh, upper urethral close to the GPG junction. And it is a seven millimeter stone and it has a Hansford unit of 700. Uh, we, can, we can see the CT scan of this patient. For the uh, upper urethral stones, we always try to do a semi-rigid urethroscope. However, you cannot always reach the every stone. And those stones can stuck at certain location. And uh, it, is not, uh, it is not a logical thing to disintegrate the stone at that uh, point. You, we want to push the stone into the kidney. However, when you try to do that, your uh, scope can get damaged. And again, when you try to do a flexible urethroscopy for the upper urethral stones, uh, if you do deflection uh, uh, unintentionally, then you can have uh, damage for in the, the flexion mechanism of the scope. That's why it is better to have a disposable scope at certain location. So for this uh, patient, we try to push the stone into the kidney with the flexible scope and it went to the uh, lower pole. Then we grab the stone and pull it onto the uh, upper, uh, upper cut upper calyx and disintegrate the stone there. Again, would we'll take the stone out of the body, some pieces for the uh, analysis and reintroduce a J-stand afterwards. Again, as you can see, the image quality is very, very well. Uh, these operations were done with the previous, uh, previous, uh, how to say, um, software of the person. So, uh, the 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 upper pole of the the, the upper pole of the field field seemed to be uh, shady, but uh, with the new uh, software, we don't have any issues like that. Uh, Doctor Ismail, do we have time? Because I, if you have time, I will again share three cases, three interesting cases. If you don't have much time, I'll just stop here and give some brief information uh, in, in, you, you, in you have the last one, the last case. Uh, we have, okay. Yes, so you, 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 we, have, we have 30 minutes. I think okay. Uh, uh, so this, is a two, two, this is a 52 years old male. He has uh, multiple, multiple stones in different uh, calluses. And for these patients, uh, uh, I do endoscopic combined intrarenal surgery. And he also has uh, stones in the bladder. So the best option for these kind of patients is supine position. And as you can see, we start, uh, we, we start from the lower calyx. We, we do a puncture and get into the kidney from the lower calyx, but we couldn't get to the other calyces, which are just neighboring the uh, lower pole. So even, you, even though you use a flexible uh, nephroscope, you can't get uh, close, you can't get to the neighboring calyces. In those times, the best option is to use a flexible one, flexible scope. And flexible scopes can also get damaged at time of accuracy. I know several uh, well-known surgeons um, which actually uh, lay, which actually damage the scope uh, uh, from the um, uh, from the percutaneous side with the laser, and as you can see, we use Poussin scope, and we could we we can get rid of 
almost every stone, only a five millimeter stone was not uh, available and we, we couldn't find the um, mojita, we couldn't find the uh, opening of the calyx, calyx for that stone, so only he had that residual stone. Uh, this is another patient, again, a 53 years old male. He had stones uh, in two uh, different calyx, uh, two, in two different uh, middle calyx, which are neighboring to each other. And we did a puncture to, uh, uh, to the middle calyx, but we, we couldn't get to the other one. Uh, since it is the neighboring one, the best option is again to do a uh, endoscopic combined intraoral surgery. So with the retrograde uterus, with the retrograde flexible uteroscopy, we can get rid of every stone. And this is our last case. Oh, it didn't work. This is our last case. This is a. Uh, 58 years old male, he had a previous uh, flexible uterus in another center and they failed to get the stone out of the body because they couldn't find the stone. And when we do, uh, uh, when we do uh, a retrograde uh, pilograph to this patient, we can see that he has a duplicated uh, system and the the um, mojita, the, the lower mojitas uh, opening is to the upper ureter. And as you can see, the deflection uh, is really hard. I mean, you, you are forcing your uh, ureteroscope to get through the lower mojita. And I, and I really don't want to do such surgeries with my reusable uh, scope because it can easily get damaged. So I, I used the Pusen scope, as you can see, I forced everything, but still I couldn't get to the lower moita. And in other um, time, we did a percutaneous uh, approach for this certain patient. We get to the, we get access to the lower moita with the uh, nephroscope and disintegrate the stone, get it out, and again, with the combined uh, flexible uh, uh, ureteroscopy, we dilate the uh, opening of the lower moita, and now this patient is doing well. Okay. Oh. It, it's and last you, slide. Probably last two slides. And those are the, you know, those are the, oops. and those are the image uh, that you can get with the Poulsen scope. As you can see, we can see every, uh, everything. I mean, he has several pittings and uh, pluggings uh, at the uh, papilla. And for the last words, but this Poussin scope is actually doing well. Why? Because uh, the the firm is the the firm is doing several improvements the, with the software with the scopes, and it is the lightest scope that you can have among all reusable and disposable scopes. And uh, for my country, I I know that it they have a better cost because they. Uh, they, they, their uh, price is less than the others. Uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your kind invitation. Thank you, Mr. Yoder and Tanader for this presentation. It's very interesting. I think uh, we have uh, uh, few times, I think uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes for discussion and uh, I can't, I can't agree more about what you said about the advantage of disposable flexible ureteroscopy and uh, the disadvantage of reusable uh, in our context uh, in developing countries like Morocco. I think there is a problem of availability. The cost is very high for the reusable. 
And also for the sterilization, we are not sure. And uh, in case of breakage, because in our experience, I have two reusable uh, ureteroscope breakdown and still now is, they are not repaired because uh, they, are, they got to be shipped to Germany and, uh, and so on and we are waiting. And uh, meantime, uh, thanks uh, for the, the availability of the disposable ureteroscope that we have and uh, that uh, really uh, treating patients and not waiting for the repair of uh, the reusable. Uh, also, I can add in our experience, uh, as uh, we are a service, we, we don't treat a challenging cases, you know, uh, we don't treat a challenging cases with the flexible uteroscopy because we, que we keep the challenging cases for, 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 for PCNL. And uh, however, uh, we have uh, three reusable, uh, flexible uteroscope, and uh, we have two that they are break down, and we have only one that uh, subside with a blurring vision. Mm -hmm. We cannot repair, and uh, so I can't agree more about what you say about this, this advantage. I don't know, uh, Dr. Wang Gang, if you can add something about uh, this uh, topic of advantage and this and disadvantage of uh, single use and reusable. Dr. Wong. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ilarin. Thank you for an uh, excellent presentation. I, I also agree with uh, you and Dr. Sarf. Uh, the re reusable flexible scopes gives us uh, more uh, uh, convenience. And uh, for whenever, uh, not only for the, the, the maintenance, but also for the, 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 the easy way to use it and its high quality uh, image and uh, deflection and uh, uh, maneuver aspects. I agree with you all. Uh, the dis uh, disposable ureteroscopes gives us new uh, tools to treat our patients. It's good both for, for, the, for our doctors and for our patients. Yeah. These are questions in the, in the chat box. Dr. Abdul Hamid uh, asking, what about if the patient is obese and has very large stone, like seven centimeters? Is it an issue to do uh, PCNL surgery? I mean, you can always yes. do a PCNL surgery for an obese patient. It, it is not seven, an issue, I guess. Seven centimeters is very large for... Very large, yeah. It, it is really hard to do a flexible scope, flexible ureteroscope for those patients because you need uh, too much time to disintegrate the stone and it, it's always an issue to, because you can have ischemia in the ureter and it will lead to other problems. I, I don't prefer to do a flexible ureteroscopy before those patients. Even if we use uh, the chili of paper? I mean, now even if, about yeah, the, yeah, you know, we, we have tilium, but you know, with the, with, even with the tilium, you will have many pieces floating around and it is really an obstacle for you because the vision will get lost even with two centimeter stones, you have several part, parts floating around and you can't really identify the pieces, the right pieces to disintegrate. So it, it is always an issue. I don't know if you have any comment, Dr. Bong? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. For large stones, even, even if the patient uh, in a, a very big obesity uh, situation, the first choice may be PCNL. But it depends. Sometimes if the stone uh, is big in length, but the stone is a uh, little bit slim, a slim, a long slim stone with too many foods. And if you've done it uh, with a PCL, 
maybe you have to, to, to try to do multiple punctures. And uh, if each puncture is difficult, multi-puncture is more difficult for, to do it. So for, uh, according to the, 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 so when we make a decision, uh, we not only uh, uh, based on the, the length of the stone, we also depends on the uh, volume of the, of the stone and the uh, configuration. Yes, if the stone, though it's uh, a little bit long, long, but it's narrow and with many uh, angled calyces, we need to do it with a PCL with multi uh, difficulty and uh, high possibility of uh, in in indications, then. Uh, the uh, staged FURS may be a choice, yeah. Well, I don't have any experience with the new uh, tritium fiber laser, but again, er everything has a purpose. If you can't do a PCNO operation, uh, I, I guess you shouldn't do uh, such interventions for those patients. I mean, you can, you can always do a laparoscopic surgery or you can also do an open surgery, which is indeed not preferred nowadays, uh, but you can, it, it's not logical to do a flexible one for this patient. Yes, I agree with you. I think the safety is mandatory, you know, yeah, whatever, right. but the safety for, for the patient is mandatory. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, for you, Dr. Gilderman, concerning the lifespan of a reusable flexible ureteroscopy for your experience, uh, your experience. Yep. How long you may keep a reusable, flexible ureteroscope in your practice? Okay, so, so of in, my, in my last institution, I've been working for six years and we had five scopes and we have been operating several patients. And most of these scopes and, and uh, more than a hundred of cases. However, uh, there are two, two uh, patients which actually make me unhappy. And those are the ones like the one that I told you, the one who had a stone on the upper ureter. Uh, my, my device actually got damaged when I was trying to push it into the kidney. And the other one was uh, a patient uh, with, uh, with, let's say, uh, large prostate, and he had strictures. And again, when I try to do operations on those patients, I mean, the for the complicated patients, you shouldn't use your reusable one because you can really uh, get damage. Apart from that, uh, they can end more than 100 cases. But again, uh, they can also get get damaged in a couple of cases, which will which will make you unhappy. So you have to know for which patients you you will use which instrument because you can force the limits. You can do whatever you want to do uh, with the disposable ones. But for the reusable one, you are not taking care of the patient. You are taking care of the scope. <laughs> really. Well, I hope it's, it's clean. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Uh, for Dr. Yularen, you, you, uh, you, uh, you mentioned a micro casting analysis. Yeah, that's right. Uh, com yes, com Dr. comparable, comparable, comparable uh, uh, the cost between reusable and disposable. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't you think that in favor, uh, that's, I think the cost is comparable, but don't you think that this is in favor of the disposable as uh, you, you are preventing problem of sterilization and contamination if yeah, the but, cost is the same? Yeah, but you know, uh, I, di I didn't provide too much information about that. There is a certain patient number that you have to reach for the reusable one. If you do not operate more, more than 50 cases, then uh, you won't get the uh, right number, right cost, because 
you will pay uh, like 20,000 uh, euros for a reusable one in the first uh, first um, getting uh, as the first getting uh, obtaining money the cost is higher at the very first step however with the disposable one you are just spending the money uh, per score which doesn't actually cost you a lot and again they both have other other problems you have to uh, you have to have a special trained uh, uh, nurse to get uh, to get uh, in charge of the reasonable one and you again have to pay for that so the all these costs actually is not uh, the single uh, uh, the single price of the score. There are other things that that actually matters, and those uh, matter with the reusable one, not with the disposable one. So if you are doing a couple of cases in a month, don't don't bother to have a reusable one. Please take a disposable one. It will be better for you. And if you are in the very first steps of your learning, we are in a training center. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to actually give my uh, reusable one to my trainee. However, he has to, or she has to learn how to do the procedure. So the disposable one is best for the training centers. It is best for the new learners, but the reusable one are better for the high volume centers. The message is clear. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like uh, I'd like the video that uh, you have shared about the combining surgery, combining yeah. flexible nephroscopy, and the uh, and the PCNL. So uh, this technique of combining, do you plan it? I mean, earlier or just? To, on the fly, when you are, and then you say, "Oh, give me my uh, flexible urethroscope yeah. to, to do so." Just, yeah, there, there are two, two. Yeah, there are two two different uh, occasions actually. Uh, for example, I I didn't. Oh, yes, you see, I didn't put every patient. So I have a, a small child. She had almost five. You know, she had three centimeters stone, and she was. Uh, four years old. We started uh, with the percutaneous approach. However, the stone, half of the stone migrated to the upper pole. And I, I couldn't get my device to the stone uh, from the uh, percutaneous axis. So in, in times like that, I mean, you, you don't actually plan to do a flexible bone. Uh, but since we are doing the operations in spine, you can always use uh, the uh, retrograde fashion to get rid of the remnants. But there are certain times, I mean, if a patient has several stones and uh, I'm sure that single puncture will not be enough, I always advise uh, the patient that I am going to do such a surgery. But again, for every patient, we always say, if we need, we will use the retrograde uh, roots, but I mean, you, you can understand for whom uh, you will do what, what you want to do. If there, there are stones in, within the neighboring calluses, it is impossible to get from one to another. And it doesn't really make sense to do two punctures for those patients. For those patients, it is clear that you will do endoscopic combined surgery. For large volume stones, you, you can do endoscopic combined surgery. For stones that, that are impacted, you can do to the ureter, you can do endoscopic combined surgery. But it doesn't really make sense for the one stone, small two centimeter pelvic stone. Uh, if it migrates and if you can't reach to the stone, then we change the plan and do the uh, switch to the endoscopic combined surgery. Yeah. Dr. Wong, you want to add something? 
I think that the, the supine position that uh, you you do you do it for everyone because in our in our in our experience experience we do the supine position in case of needing the approach from above and from below and uh, I think that's the advantage of the supine position. Yeah. What do you think? For me or for Dr. Bong? Uh, for both of oh, you. Yeah. Okay. I I I get my training with the prone position, and I can do very well with that. Uh, for us, for the uh, mentors, I I mean, for the mentors, it is really hard to switch from one operation to another one because you start again, and it is really hard uh, when you are doing these uh, these kind of things. But I get the impression that spine is actually better than the prone and i don't really uh, want to switch back to prone for certain patients when there are problems uh, you, uh, and when i need prone position i i will do that but it is it doesn't really make sense for me to do a prone surgery anymore because you cannot do the puncture from the upper pelvis. you can do whatever you want to do and the retrograde route is always under your Hand. You can do everything, so I think it's better to do spine, uh, and I'm very pleased with that. For the last four years, let let me say, for the last four years, we are only doing spine. Uh, my opinion uh, is uh, also to use a combined technique. Uh, to treat uh, complicated stones. The, the position of the patient may be a uh, supine uh, lithotomy, or even with, we can do it uh, with, a combined, uh, with a position of prone position, uh, splitting the, the legs of the patient before operation. Uh, that means you have to use a, a special uh, operation table to, to split the, the, the patient uh, legs. Uh, Normally, we, we will uh, make this decision uh, before the operation. For complicate, uh, complicated cases, uh, if we uh, plan to, to, to use uh, combined uh, techniques, we will put the position uh, with the uh, oblique supine lithotomy position or with a, a prone splitting position uh, before the operation. And you know what? My, my, my residents and my staff is very happy because they don't need to turn the patient. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yes. Okay. I think, what, what time now in China, Dr. Wang? I think it's very late. It's uh, half past nine in the evening. Okay, okay. I think uh, we, uh, it's about one hour and three that we are discussing. And... Uh, we can we yeah. can to the end. you can see what what's outside our my window <laughs> yeah oh black <laughs> no. light it's black <laughs> light. <Yeah>. light okay <laughs> the light. same is light yeah. again it's afternoon in in turkey yeah okay so uh, thanks a lot uh, for our guest speakers dr wang yang for um, his uh, his uh, presentation about uh, the use of flexible arthroscopy for the treating the drug uh, urinary, urinary, urinary uh, lithiasis in the diversion, uh, and also for Dr. Yolar uh, Tanader for his experience in the ad advantage of flexible arthroscopy and uh, for the, the video surgery showing the combining surgery and, and, and so on. And thanks, Pleasant, because this wasn't company that uh, building bridge between us between uh, in the different regions and the shooting experience we are learning a lot uh, today and uh, also we thank the participants that uh, they keep staying with us and uh, we cannot ask uh, uh, i mean uh, answer all the questions in the chat box there are some questions that we cannot uh, show and uh, thank Thanks a lot. Mr. Yoran, the last word? Well, 
uh, it is an honor to be with you. Thank you for being a part of this faculty. And I really enjoy that. Uh, and I hope to see uh, both you in Turkey in some time in the future. Uh, thank you very much for both your uh, contributions. And I, I also want to thank Pusin for the kind invitation. Thank you very much. And also a, another thanks for the participants. Dr. Wang Gang, I think uh, last word. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Sir, for uh, for uh, moderating this uh, webinar, uh, and thanks, Prusen, to give us this uh, platform to to communicate and to share our experience to to you and to other uh, colleagues on the web. Uh, and we hope, uh, Prusen, uh, with the technique uh, development, uh, Prusen will uh, revolve forward and give us uh, more. Uh, good products for our operation. Okay, I have to and thank. I have a host, yes. uh, if you uh, have a chance back, uh, come to Beijing, I will uh, show you uh, around and treat you. We hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We thank also again, person because person uh, he helped. Uh, it helped us last year about our first workshop in Marrakesh inviting people and uh, because of this pandemic in fact in this september we have to, to organize the workshop but i think for the future after the pandemic we hope that uh, this faculty uh, dr yoran and dr wong to to be our guests in marrakesh in our workshop and Thank you very to, much. to 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 get from your experience thank, thank you, you very much. much thank you very much and uh, see thank you much. later Thank you, I'd like to. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.